I love Dr. Stone so much that when it hurts me, it hurts me bad. The show is a well-written, obsessively well-researched love letter to science, and I can't help but feel that if this were around when I was a teenager 75 years ago, my dubious life choice of becoming a biologist could have actually made me popular. For those of you who watch YouTube videos about shows they didn't see, Dr. Stone is about Senku, an impossibly well-read and intelligent scientist, even though he's only a teenager, and then suddenly everyone in the world is turned to stone. Senku wakes up some 3,000 years later and has to rebuild civilization from the Stone Age, thus the title. By the way, spoilers for the first 24 episodes of the anime. Part 1. The Central Premise of Scientific Thinking most media treat science like a magic stick that you wave around to do cool things, but Dr. Stone defines science better than most textbooks. This definition might seem too broad at first glance, but it's important in what it's not. Senku's definition of science doesn't center hypothesis-driven research. Formally, hypothesis-driven research is a method of starting with a scientific question, then setting up a hypothesis, which you then go on to try to prove if you're a scrub, or actively disprove if you know what you're doing. Hypothesis-driven research is often placed front and center in most scientific education and writing, but it is not how a lot of the best research is done. A famous example of this is sequencing the human genome. Yes, Francis, I see the benefit in such a project and how it could be a massively useful resource for all biomedical, evolutionary, and basic research. But what is the hypothesis you want to test, hmm? The hypothesis that I want to kick you in the face but the show really won me over forever when Senku immediately goes on to mention that one problem he was trying to solve took over a year and that he expected it to take longer. And yes, in real life, that shit takes time, as exemplified by my half-decade-long PhD. Senku also gleefully points out when he makes mistakes, like thinking that the North Star is true north, but it wouldn't be so many years in the future. He also goes on to train a protege, Chrome, rather early in the show, Another nod to the fact that training and research often goes hand in hand. More interesting, though, is what happens when Senko gives Chrome a problem to solve alone due to some ticking clock. He does this by telling Chrome to put together what he learned so far and come up with a solution himself. This is very much like how science training is done, with you first being handheld through the ways of critical thinking and the protocols and specific techniques, and then being given free reign to use them on your own. I really dug that, especially since the answer Chrome came up with was not one that Senku was thinking of. But it worked, and Senku readily accepted the answer, even admitting it was likely a better answer than the one he came up with himself, which is just peak best scientist behavior. You would think that with my being an insufferably pretentious a-hole that I greatly disliked the part in Dr. Stone where a naked high schooler punches a lion to death. But that was so damn rad that the weeaboo sulcus of my brain expanded to completely eclipse all rational thought and the ability to control my sphincter. The superhumanly strong Tsukasa was a solid setup for the central conflict, with Senku's physical weakness but access to technical knowledge being pitted against the absurdity of Tsukasa's pure physicality, as if Senku's OP skill is balanced narratively by someone that is equally strong, but in a different way. Kind of brilliant in a storytelling sense. To this, I can't help but take out my scientist cap and nod contently with my media enjoyment cap. No, what bothers me is not the usual shonen bullshit. What gets to me is the pandering. Part 2. The Pandering When Senku is first setting up his camp, he makes a big declarative statement on his foundational belief as a scientist and boldly inscribes E equals MC squared into his shirt. Very high shown and inspirational, but it kinda kills my soul that it should have been another formula. What the show really could have used was the first law of thermodynamics, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed in an isolated system, that it can only be transferred from one form to the other. Einstein's equation 
only establishes that mass is equivalent to energy. That's not exactly relevant to what Senko was testing. He was trying to find different ways that the stone could be providing energy to the petrified, and that providing an excess of the right kind of energy, he could release the person that was petrified. It was not the mass of the stone, but the energy. And Dr. Stone, in fact, shows Senku trying different ways of adding energy to the system to try to reverse the petrification, such as rubbing it or burning it. Some formula relating to the first law of thermodynamics would have fit the show much better. But no, the show had to go with the one thing that people were familiar with, even if they could have been narratively more satisfying, and the chance to teach the audience about something they likely didn't know. I think about it every time I notice the equation in his lapel. Every single time. And it is such a huge part of his look throughout the entire show. Like they are so proud of that little bit. This particular choice encapsulates a bigger problem that often happens in general audience facing media. The watering down of science, not for the sake of clarity, but for the sake of pandering. To make the audience feel clever by saying, Hey brah, I recognize that. It's that Einstein equation thing, huh? And I have evidence to back this up too. The moment that Senko is talking about Einstein, this picture of Einstein shows up. This goes by kind of fast, and in the moment you are swept up in the speech, so you might not catch it. But look at this picture and think for a second. Is there something wrong with it? Maybe something that doesn't quite fit? This is a picture from our world, not the anime world of Senku. This is the narrative equivalent of Senku talking about his dad, then whipping out a photo, and it's not another anime character, but some random dude in real life. This, of course, would be jarring and take you right out of the scene, but why doesn't this dissonance happen with the real world, very much not an anime picture of Einstein? Well, first of all, the show artifies it a bit, so the contrast isn't so jarring. But that's not it. The real reason is that the purpose of the picture is to remind the audience that this is famous to them. Aren't you smart for knowing who Einstein is, either by name or from this very famous picture? Pandering. Now that I'm all worked up with self-righteous indignation, why does scientific wonderlust always have to be about space? Senku's love for science early on is framed as his desire to go to space, and the spaceship and stars is the flag of his settlement. I get it. We went to the moon, it was a big deal to show up the Ruskies, but goddamn, talk about wallowing in accomplishments from over half a century ago. This might be the bitter biologist in me, but I'd like a romantic portrayal of science that doesn't have as its crown jewel the pissing contest between world powers over who could reach a faraway rock first. Sure, Dr. Stone frames it more in terms of an international space station, not exactly the moon landing, but it doesn't actually try to develop or even mention why spaceflight is such hot shit. It just assumes it is. I mean, the awesomeness of global telecommunications is brought up, but not with the same loving embrace as a romantic notion of going to space. This wouldn't be as egregious if we didn't have a more recent big event in physics itself. With the discovery of the Higgs boson, 12,000 people came together in an investment of over $10 billion, all to discover something truly fundamental to science. But again, people recognize space is a cool thing, so gotta use that instead. Why can't anime just always be about the things I wanna see? Part 3. Blowing my goddamn mind. Dr. Stone has some of the most brilliant plot developments and world building that I ever saw in anime. The title itself evolves as you watch. At first it's a reference to everybody turning to stone, then that they're in the stone age. But then they mention the making of soap as a form of Dr. Stone, since it's the only medicine in the stone age. At which point the biologist in me just smiled in sweet, sweet contentment. But the show didn't stop there. Later, somebody brings up the stone ray's uncanny ability to cure people when reversed, suggesting that it might not be a military attack, but a form of medicine, a true Dr. Stone. Ah, at this point I got such narrative fulfillment joygasm I had to change onesies. In a smaller scale but very deft setup and payoff, a side character, Suika, is shown wearing a ridiculous helmet, which my wee brain automatically just accepted as anime randomness. But then Senko recognized it as a problem that science can solve, and I don't actually want to spoil it because it's brilliant, but it is the kind of cleverness that I rarely get to see in any media. 
when driven by a deep understanding of a scientific concept that at once explains the concept to the audience and solidifies it so well in a beautiful story that ensures the audience will never forget that particular information ever again since it's so woven into the fabric of what happened. But since we're here, I'd be disingenuous if I didn't also mention part four, usual shonen bullshit. These are points beyond Dr. Stone in particular and even beyond the shonen genre, but here it goes anyway. Everything is so damn sexless and sterile. For instance, when Senku meets Kohaku, she voices her liking him, and he's just like, I don't like anybody. And the scientist who doesn't care about romance because he's so much about science is just so tired. Maybe his character would have been at least flustered by that interaction, or not know how to react and just change the topic. You know, a more human reaction. I mean, even the overtly romantic relationship between Taiju and Yuzuhira seems frozen in place to keep it teen boy safe, I guess? I mean, I get it. Shonen limitations imposed by the genre, but come on. I'm told that occasionally people have romantic relationships before they descend into straight-up hentai. Also, does everybody have to look like a bodybuilder? I mean, makes sense for the meatheads and warriors, but look at these abs. These are the abs of someone that goes to the gym every damn day. But to be frankly honest, I'm, I'm not really mad about this, since this general anime trend is just so good at seducing my uh, horny reptile brain. On an unrelated note, can someone please call Japan and tell them that their disposable pop music is not the most mind-blowing, deeply emotional, enlightenment-level event that they keep trying to convince everybody it is? At one point, Senku unearths a recording from the ancestors of a group of humans that managed to avoid turning to stone, and the recording includes a cheesy-ass pop ballad, and it is so terrible that the cringe makes my skin turn inside out. It was a moment where I had to get up and stare at the mirror to wonder, who am I? What am I doing with my life? What is reality even? Part 5. The Real Hurt the biggest issue I have with Dr. Stone comes from seeing that the show gets so much about being a scientist right, but then goes on to make the usual media mistakes. I can understand some writer who never stepped into a lab and has no idea how scientific work is done, simply deferring to what they see in other media. Not great, but fine. But for people who have clearly looked into the technical details of how to build a light bulb, for instance, this hits me kind of hard. The problematic idea of the scientist as broadly knowledgeable and impossibly young. I have a PhD in genetics. This means I don't know much at all about other fields of biology like biochemistry, molecular biology, and ecology, and absolutely don't know anything about fields like metallurgy, material science, and making fucking swords. What I think would be even more interesting than a singular Dr. Stone is if a whole research institute was frozen and then revived, and they all had to put their knowledge together to solve these problems, and even then there would be huge gaps that they would have to compensate for. But that seems really hard to pull off narratively, so sure, why not just defer to the tired old making one super genius Leonardo da Vinci times 1000. Another related issue is that Senku often comes up with plans that are far too complex to solve the problems at hand. His solution to an army coming to attack his group is to build an incredibly complicated and delicate radio communications device. This is a hugely complex plan that seems unlikely to work, especially compared to an earlier plan of his being just making better weapons. One might excuse this as a shonen genre allowance to make it exciting, but this still hurt, especially compared to the more subdued elegance of earlier in the series, where he figured out how to test different ways to revert the stone curse, which to me was far more compelling than seeing him try to do these ridiculous high levels of manufacturing in a stone-aged village. Why does this matter, since all these narrative shorthands arguably make the story more watchable, I guess? Well, all these components effectively coalesce into the idea of scientists as superhuman, capable of ludicrous things in a very short amount of time at a comically young age. An idea that the show itself earlier rails against. But you might say that sports anime, for instance, also has this exaggeration, and they do. But most people have also watched a volleyball game, at least in passing, so when they see a sports anime, they know it's all narrative gloss. But very few people, even those studying a STEM major in college, get a sense of how long research takes and how collaborative it is. 
those of us that grow up consuming media like this then have to face the realities of being a scientist. Training in most disciplines can mean being a student until your late 20s, then having to do a long postdoc or two before becoming an independent researcher with your own lab. The average age in the United States for a biologist to get their first grant as a lab head, the point where you are really doing your own research, is over 40. If happiness is accomplishment minus expectation, setting your expectations even a little bit in line with what Senku can accomplish as a teenager will make any scientist in training unhappy. And this is not a small problem. Research in all fields is rife with systemic problems of mental health, stemming in large part from the long time it takes to get anything done and the exorbitant expectations placed upon researchers themselves. And this problem is not just for people who want to become scientists. Non-scientists who see how fast science progresses in media get disappointed that science in real life doesn't seem to go fast enough. That we as scientists make promises to society that we don't keep. Like the Back to the Future promise of a hoverboard by 2015. Incidentally, this was a very meh science fiction movie and very much not based on real science. But this form of hoverboard disappointment has real-world implications since lack of patience with research can cause downturns in funding or the stagnation of university support for essential but slower-moving fields. Dr. Stone didn't cause these problems, of course, and trying to make any form of entertainment that doesn't suffer in this way and is still even remotely watchable is probably crazy hard. But this is the burden of great entertainment. Even minor genre conventions and flaws grate that much more, but hopefully in a way that becomes a roadmap on how to do better. I really look forward to future work that might be inspired by Dr. Stone, something that combines kick-ass anime with a genuine love for science that is more grounded in the reality of what being a scientist actually looks like. Now punch that lion, hot barbarian teenager.